Welcome to Masters and Creators from Frames to Names, the show where we look at some of the most influential creators in history and how their influence impacts the way we tell stories to this day. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about master of life and death in writing, Neil Gaiman. A lot of people credit Watchmen for changing comics forever, which it totally did. But another comic and another writer took the steam from Watchmen and changed all of media forever. This is, of course, Neil Gaiman. The comic he used to do this is called Sandman, and it's simply put one of the best things you can ever read. Like, I'm not even exaggerating. It is so good, you would be very hard pressed to find someone who doesn't like Sandman. Outside of comics, Neil Gaiman has been a key writer in Doctor Who. He wrote the episode The Doctor's Wife, and his short story Coraline was even adapted into a movie. Outside of writing for TV, books, and comics, he has a really well written twist. He has some like 2.7 million followers and like I think he even won an award for how well written his Twitter is, which is kind of crazy. But like if you go in there, you're like, okay, I get it. But before we get into more detail about his work, let's talk about his life. So Neil was born in Porchester, Hampshire in 1960. While he's of Polish Jewish descent, his parents are actually Scientologists. He was raised as a Scientologist, and although he doesn't believe in the religion anymore, he does say he's just as much Jewish as he is Scientologist, in that he doesn't really believe in either, he doesn't really believe in a God, but it's definitely a major part of his life, or at least it used to be. By the time he was four, he fell in love with reading, which actually allowed him to excel in school. He's gone on record saying that he didn't exactly have an aptitude for any of the subjects in school, but as soon as he was given a workbook, he'd blast through it, and because of that he knew exactly what was coming so he had time to prepare, and this made him excel in school. He fell in love with works of fiction though, his major influences during this time were the Chronicles of Narnia series and the Lord of the Rings series. And while he did well with his studies, his school really didn't know what to do with him. At one point he went to a careers advisor, and he said to the careers advisor that he wanted to write American comic books. And the careers advisor looked him up and down, looked at his results and said, you're good at maths, how about going into accounting? And that's like all the careers advice he ever had. In the 80s, he'd get into writing professionally and his first published work, I believe, was a biography of the first four years of the band Duran Duran. This was shortly followed by a biography of Douglas Adams. However, he would form a friendship with Alan Moore and then once Alan Moore was done a miracle man, Neil Gaiman would take over. This in turn would lead him to write for 2000 in AD, which would put him on DC Comics' radar, which would allow him to write Black Orchid for them. His run on Black Orchid really served to flesh out the existing character of Black Orchid. It was the first time she had been given a proper origin, and instead of being like this regular superhero, it turned her into this human-plant hybrid with ties to DC's other nature characters like Swamp Thing and Poison Ivy. It sounds kind of corny, but if you read the comic, the whole thing's sort of a ride. It's a trip, and it's very esoteric. I can't recommend it enough. I genuinely think this was more of a prototype for Sandman than anything else. So at this time DC were doing something called the British Invasion where they saw how successful Alan Moore's Watchmen and Swamp Thing was and they were like clearly British writers know where it's at. They've got a spark about them that appeals to American audiences so let's just go with that. I pulled in a bunch of writers from the UK, including Neil Gaiman, and a bunch of them got to try it and do new things. While working on Black Orchid, Neil Gaiman actually said in passing that he'd like to work on this Silver Age character called Sandman. After the success of Black Orchid, Karen Burgess said to Gaiman, okay, you can have Sandman, but it has to be an entirely new character that you can't use the one that you wanted. And Gaiman's like, yeah, I'm gonna do it anyway. So the initial image for the character he created was from the following description. A man, young, pale, naked, imprisoned in a tiny cell, waiting until his captors pass away. Deathly thin, long dark hair, strange eyes. The initial run for the series was just going to be eight issues. It ended up lasting 75 issues long. And Gaiman has said that he could have kept going, but he just wanted to end on a high. In addition to those core 75 issues, the series had two Sandman spin-offs, a Lucifer spin-off, and multiple spin-offs of these characters that are in the series called The Endless. The whole thing has won like 26 Eisner Awards, I believe four of them were to Neil Gaiman specifically, and the whole thing is considered just as good, if not better, than Alan Moore's Watchmen. So the Sandman is about Dream, otherwise known as Sandman, otherwise known as Morpheus. He's a part of a group known as the Endless, who are the concepts that they are named after. So you have Destiny, Death, Dream, Destruction, Desire, Despair, and Delirium. And when I say they are what they are named after, I mean that very specifically. I don't mean like, oh, they're the living embodied 
embodiment of what they're named after, or oh, they're a figment of what they're named after, or they're that concept manifested. Like, no, they are that concept. It's very specific. The series picks up with Dream being captured in an occultist ritual, and he is held captive for 70 long years. When he finally escapes, it's modern day, and Dream's kingdom, the Dreaming, is in tatters, so he has to go out of his way to fix it. There's honestly no way to describe this series. It's like, this ironic comedy, horror, high fantasy with elements of sci-fi set in the DC universe, but it rarely crosses over with other DC characters, if ever. In my opinion, it's the first and only story of its kind. It's just like pure imagination. Sandman was such a success, it did something not even Watchmen did. It attracted a large audience that wasn't interested in comics whatsoever. People would come to comic shops to read Sandman, and only Sandman. On top of that, the majority of the readers were female. Keep in mind, this comic lasted 75 issues. The majority of comics these days are lucky to last 12 issues. So this is a big deal. Now, I mentioned there are a number of Sandman spin-offs. The best one, in my opinion, is one that stars one of the Endless called Death, and it's called Death, The High Cost of Living. It's one of the few spin-offs that's actually written by Neil Gaiman, and it follows Death of the Endless, and one day every 100 years she comes and lives as a human for 24 hours, and then she dies at the end of that 24 hours. So she can understand life, she can understand humans, and she can understand the gift of life that she's taking away when a person dies. The story is so sweet, and it really points out that even outside of a religious context, life is sacred because there's only one person in this entire world that's had all the experiences you have to result in the thoughts that you're having in that exact moment. There's only one of you. So appreciate you for you and live for you. It's also about the excitement of life itself and about how every day can be an adventure. Just you have to make it an adventure. You have to get up off your ass and just Find your adventure! In 2007, it was announced that there was going to be a movie made about death, the high cost of living, but then apparently the project was permanently shelved in 2010, but they still want to go ahead and make a Sandman movie, and I'm like, if you can't make death work in movie format, there is no way you can do Sandman. That is like trying to make the colour green without using anything other than blue. Another very important comic that Neil Gaiman wrote was called Books of Magic. It's about a boy with dark hair, a pet owl, and a pair of glasses who discovers his ability to use magic. Look familiar? Well, actually, a lot of people accused J.K. Rowling of stealing books of magic from Neil Gaiman. There was a big plagiarism thing going around, but Neil Gaiman came out and said that he didn't think that J.K. Rowling plagiarized his work. He thinks the two of them were probably just inspired by the author T.H. White. If you are a fan of Harry Potter, I definitely recommend checking out Books of Magic because I can see how fans thought there was a plagiarism thing going on there because the two are very similar, but also they're very distinct from one another. So definitely check out Books of Magic by Neil Gaiman. There's two series. One of them isn't written by Neil Gaiman. In 1999, he would write the novel Stardust, but in 2001, his most famous novel was published, American Gods. The concept of this book follows the idea that belief and a focal point can manifest reality, meaning fantasy creatures and gods can exist, all because people believe in them. This concept was also explored in Sandman, but American Gods just takes it to the next level, because it can. It's a novel. You don't need to worry about someone being able to draw it. I will say, American Gods is very American in its tonality, naturally, whereas Sandman's very British in its tonality. So there is one key difference between the two of them. In 2009, his short story Coraline was adapted into a movie, and I don't think he had much involvement with this film, if I'm honest. In 2010, he would write the Doctor Who episode, The Doctor's Wife, which ended up winning several awards because it's like, simply put, in my opinion, the best episode of Doctor Who there ever has been. Currently, he's actually in his fourth of a five-year appointment as a professor in Bard College in New York. And last year, he released his most recent book, Norse Mythology. I really don't know how all of this came across because a large part of Neil Gaiman's legacy and why he's so important is about Sandman, and I didn't want this to turn into just a Sandman video because he's done so much outside of Sandman, it's unreal how much this guy has done. But simply put, you just can't talk about Neil Gaiman without putting a strong focus on Sandman because it is the most important thing this guy has done, like, no doubt about it. The reason I love Neil Gaiman is that his work just has this raw imagination throughout all of it. His imagery is amazing, and if you team him up with an artist, you get magic, and I genuinely believe his best medium is comic books. I love his novels, I love his TV shows, but 
Just when he goes into comics, there's a spark there that there just isn't anywhere else. And you can see it, especially in Sandman. Like, especially in Sandman. But unfortunately, that's all we've got time for this week. So remember to tune in next week to Masters and Creators from Frames to Names. Oh.